Today is known as Shabbat Mevakarim. It's just a special Shabbat, a blessing. It's the, the Shabbat before the beginning of the new month on the Hebrew calendar, which is the month of Kislev, which is coming up. This is the 29th of, of Keshvan. And what happens in the month of Kislev? Hanukkah. Hanukkah, which will be in December. And we have a, a party that's coming up in the middle of December where we will celebrate Hanukkah. So why don't we stand this morning? Also a wonderful Torah portion today. But most of all, before, we, before Tom opens with prayer, uh, our pastor's back. And of course his wife, Vicki, too. And then all of you, the band of brothers and sisters that went along with him, welcome back as well. You all made it, so let's give them a hand. And I'm sure we'll hear some testimonies from them later and see the effect of the land upon uh, the, our people here. And, of course, we have an effect on the land when we pray and we lift Israel uh, and when we pray for the people of Israel. And, uh, and we know that the effect that you've all had on your lives and the testimonies that you have will bless everybody here. So welcome back. And uh, Tom will open the Shabbat with a word of prayer. How many are thankful today? <laughs> Amen. Well, let's, let's, let's lift up a prayer of thanks this morning. Thank you, Father. Father God, we just lift you, you up this morning, Lord. We just want to praise you for this day. We want to magnify you for this day. Lord, for this is the day that you have made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon this service today. Bless everything that's done and said and sung and danced today, Lord. It'll be to your honor and glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. The, uh, the Torah portion uh, for today is Toldot, uh, which is these are the generations. Uh, and uh, it, it, of course, continues the story uh, beyond Isaac uh, with the two nations that are in the womb of Rebekah. And it's an exciting Torah portion that gives us another hint into the conflict that we see in the world today and how God still carries us through amidst those. And Pastor Mark is excited about sharing that. So let's bring our pastor up here who we've missed for these 10 days. I'll have to say this about Pastor Mark is that, uh, you know, for those of you that have traveled, and how many of you all are here that were on the trip to Israel? If you just raise your hand. I don't know if that's all of them or not. But... Uh, Taking a trip halfway around the world can be very taxing with the flights and so on. And then the, the, uh, you would think that he would be on vacation going to Israel, which it, it kind of is a vacation, but it's also tedious in terms of the hours that are spent. Pastor Mark teaches when he's over there. Uh, he's running around doing a lot of things. And, and you're all blessed because of that, and the congregation is blessed. But I want to tell you that we have a man here that has great strength and stamina. And he comes up to the podium after being gone for a week. Uh, after two weeks on a Monday and teaches uh, Monday night Bible study and then is here for Shabbat and he's here because he loves the teacher's task and he's here to be able to help us to bring Torah to the nations. Well, thank, thank you. you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, Pastor Art. Well, it is good to be back. Uh, right now it's about my bedtime according to Israel time. Uh, I think my brain is still gelling. I'm tr trying to get everything together again. Those of you that went know exactly what I'm talking about. Many of us are still getting up at 2 in the morning. Uh, but uh, the trip was very exciting. Uh, the second half, I'll have those that went on the trip with us come up and share a little bit, those that would like to, about the trip. But it was very exciting, and I have some uh, excellent pictures to also to show you the second half. Uh, if you look at your notes, uh, there is no way I'm going to get everything covered. But we're going to kind of try and fly. But we'll, we'll just see how it goes. Uh, we may do some jumping around. I may not read every verse uh, because there's so much to cover. But I do love this Torah portion. It has to be one of my favorite. <laughs> it really is one of them. Uh, let's go ahead and put up the first PowerPoint. The name of this Torah portion is Toldot in English. In Hebrew, it's going this way. This is your T-O-L-D-O-T, -O -O going that direction. The thing about the word Toldot, I have a lot of little photographs on the branches, just like our family tree, so to speak. 
The word toldot in Hebrew means generations, but it's more than just who begat who. The Hebrew word implies also all of the stories that accompany it. For example, you may have heard about your Uncle Joe or your Aunt Susie and all the stories going all the way back. And today we're going to go all the way back to the story of uh, Jacob and Esau wrestling, you know, over the birthright. Uh, it's all those family fun things that keep one generation connected to the next generation. It's those stories that keep us connected, which is what the Torah is so exciting about in the Gospels. It keeps us connected to our roots. Now, as Art had mentioned, uh, this story of Toldot, or the generations, uh, the Torah portion is all about the birthright, the wrestling between Jacob and Esau. So uh, here we have the word Toldot. You know, I have our family tree. But in Genesis 2, 4, it talks about the generations of the heavens and the earth. We see it says in Genesis 2, 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. I wasn't going to go here, but this verse always amazes me. You know, how long is a generation? How many years? Okay, and here it says generations, plural. So now you're talking many years. And yet it says, these are the generations in the day that the Lord created heavens and the earth. How can you get generations within a day? This interesting thought. But aside from that, I want to show you something here. Genesis 2-4, when it talked about the word generations, it had the word toldot there. Now, I want you to notice in the word toldot, I have a little family tree here. These are the O's. Uh, the Vav stand for the letter O in Toldot, Hebrews right to left versus left to right. So you see here, this Vav represents the first O, and this Vav represents the second O. Is everyone following me here? All right. In Genesis 25, 19, this is the beginning of our Torah portion. It has the word Toldot, and it says, These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham begat Isaac. Well, the, there's an amazing thing about this word toldot in Genesis 25, 19. I think I touched on this a few weeks ago. The letter O, the letter Vav is missing. Why in the world? So you only see this in Hebrew. You don't see it in English. The very word, the generations in Genesis 2, 4 is spelled correctly with the Vav. Now, all of a sudden, you see it spelled without a Vav. Why is that? Why? I mean, obviously, God knows how to spell. Okay, so any misspellings are well-intentioned. God is trying to make a point to us. Well, what I want to do is, where is look at when did the first misspelling occur? In Genesis 2-4, with the creations of the heaven and the earth, that second vav was there. But let's look. If you go to Genesis 5-1, where it talks about Adam's family tree, this is the first time that letter vav disappears. Genesis 5.1, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. So I think it's interesting <clears throat> when you realize, let me go ahead and go to this next clip. The letter Vav is also has a numerical value of six, because it's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and in Hebrew, every letter is also a number. We know man was created on the sixth day. And so here we see Adam is representative of the Vav. Well, all of a sudden, the Vav is broken. And uh, I'll put a little plug in for Monday nights. On Monday nights, starting this coming Monday, I just did an intro last Monday, I'm going to spend, uh, we're going to divide the session up. We'll talk about a Hebrew letter every week. I'm going to introduce a Hebrew letter. There's 22 Hebrew letters. So over the next 22 weeks, I'm going to spend one Monday night on one Hebrew letter. Now you might, you know, how can you talk 45 minutes about the letter A, okay? Well, I can easily talk 45 minutes on the letter Aleph. And in six weeks, we're gonna to get to the letter Vav. And the letter Vav is so dynamic. It is so incredible. Uh, Zephaniah 3.9 talks about how God's gonna restore a pure language, okay? And that's good. it's the Hebrew language. And so we'll be looking at that. But the, the letter Vav here represents man, and the letter Vav is a connecting force. In ancient Hebrew, it looked like a nail. And a nail, what does it do? It connects two things. Uh, the importance of the Bob is what connects heaven and earth. Well, all of a sudden, Adam has sinned. And so now, right after Adam has sinned, when it talks about the generations, the Bob is missing. Okay? So do you know that 
this word toldot is misspelled over a hundred times, or almost a hundred times. The rest of, all the Torah is misspelled. The next time it gets spelled correctly is in the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, now these are the generations of Peretz. And guess what? Why is this so significant? Because if you look in Ruth 4, 21 and 22, it talks about how Peretz ends up begetting Obed, who beget Jesse, who beget David. Well, David was the missing man. He is the one who's going to connect heaven and earth. And this is who Yeshua came from. Which is why in Matthew 1, 1, it says, The book of the generation of Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of who? Now, we know his dad was Joseph. But it says the son of David because it's making that vav, that connection between heaven and earth. And so here, all of a sudden, it's spelled correctly because the Messiah is the missing man through this David's seed. This portion, as I mentioned, talks about the story of Jacob and Esau. One of the interesting things is how Jacob is described. And this is why it's good to have more than one Bible or more than one translation. In Genesis 25, 27, it talks about how Esau was a cunning hunter and Jacob was a plain man. Well, what in the world does plain mean? A plain man, he was just plain. Well, in another version, it says the boys grew, Esau became a man skilled at hunting, a man of the field, and Jacob was a homely man. Okay, so one version says he was plain, another one says he was homely. Let's look at another version. Uh, the boys grew, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a quiet man. Okay, so what was he? Was he plain? Was he homely? Was he quiet? What kind of a man is he? Well, what's interesting is when you look at the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew uh, root word is tom, where you get the word tame from, and it means to be without blemish. We see that in Exodus 12, 5, the Passover lamb had to be without blemish. So in other words, he was to be considered a morally pious person, undefiled and upright. So that gives you a better idea of what Jacob was like. The word uh, tame, you see it's Strong's number 8549. It means integrity, truth, without blemish, complete, blameless, without spot. Now I want to show you this next clip here. In Genesis 26, 1 through 5, I'll go ahead and put it up in a picture of the land of Israel. And considering our trip, we were, see, Tel Dan is way up here on the Lebanon-Syrian border. And we traversed all of Tel Dan. We literally looked into Lebanon. We looked into Syria, a little place called Kenitra. We did the whole Sea of Galilee. Uh, we came, we also went to Itamar, uh, Mount Gerizim. We went by Shiloh. We definitely went to the Dead Sea. The exciting thing was, here, the very Torah portion we went to Israel was the Torah portion where God told Abraham to come to the land I will show you. The next weekend, we're at the Dead Sea, and the Torah portion is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah at the Dead Sea. The next weekend is Kaisera, and what are we, where are we? We're in Hebron looking at the tomb that Abraham bought. We were just following the Torah portions. But then, of course, we went all the way down to Elat and up to Mitzpah Ramon, the Ramon Crater. Uh, we went the whole way, east to west, north to south. But what's interesting is in Genesis 26, it talks about how there was a famine in the land of Israel, besides the one that, the first one that was in Abraham's day. And this verse talks about how God told Isaac, you're not going down to Egypt. Even though Abraham went to Egypt and Jacob went to Egypt, God told Isaac, you're staying here. Now, what would our common sense say? Okay, but there's a famine. Hello, God. You know, there's a famine in the land. And yet... Look at what it says here. Here God tells Isaac, he says, I'm going to make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give into your seed all of these countries and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, look at what I have underlined here. It's incredible. It says, because Abraham obeyed my voice, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Well, wait a minute. Abraham is 500 years before Moses. What is this talking about? Abraham, 500 years before Moses, keeping all the commandments and the laws and the statutes. Okay, that's very interesting. But uh, even though Abraham is the father of our faith, we also see he, he obeyed, which is so important. In Genesis 26, 12 through 14, here's the thing. Isaac sowed in that land during this time of famine, and yet he received the same year a hundredfold. Now, that's pretty incredible. 
So here, even though it's a time of famine, and Isaac was thinking, I need to go down to Egypt, God said, you stay here, and I'm going to bless you. And look at this. He didn't just do great. I mean, he did sababa. <clears throat> sababa. That's fantastic in Hebrew. And so it says that they envied him. In Genesis 26, 12 through 14, it says, Isaac sowed in that land and received the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and he waxed great. Well, here's what's interesting. Let's go to this next clip. In Matthew 13, 3, in the Gospels, it says, Yeshua spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. I can't help but think of Isaac in this story. In verse 8, it says, How some fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, and how many? A hundredfold. And then in verse 23, he says, He that received the seed into good ground is he that hears the word, he understands it, and then what does he do? He bears fruit. What does it mean to bear fruit? The bear fruit means it's producing good works. See, you, there's this dichotomy. People think that if you're saved by grace, you don't have to do anything. We are saved by grace through faith. But if you're saved by grace through faith, you're going to produce fruit. Okay? You're gonna, you're gonna, people are going to be able to see your good works, and they're going to glorify not you, but God for that. <clears throat> now, in Genesis 21, 22 through 25, it talks about how Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spoke to Abraham. And they're saying, well, uh, we see God's with you in everything you're doing, so swear unto me right here by God that you're not going to deal falsely with me, nor with my son or my son's son. But according to the kindness I've done to you, shall you do to me in the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, okay, I'll swear. And then Abraham reproves Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. Okay, now this isn't part of our Torah portion. This is the one before. But I want to show you here in this next clip, Here's the very well. We got to go right by Abraham's well in Beersheba to be incredible. We couldn't, they were doing construction, so we couldn't actually go in. We were kind of leaning over a fence, taking a picture of it. But to be right there uh, at this very well, and then you read in Genesis 26, 27 through 29, again, the Philistines come, and Isaac says to them, why have you come to me, seeing you hate me, and you've sent me away from you? And they said, well, we certainly saw the Lord is with you. So here we see the generation before, in Abraham's day, the Philistines basically saw that God was with Abraham. The next generation, they again, with Isaac, see God is with Isaac. And so they say, let there be an oath between us, between us and you, and let us make a covenant that you will do us no hurt, as we have not touched you, and as we have done unto you nothing but good. Yeah, right. And we sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Well, I believe in one sense, prophetically, the time is coming when the people, uh, the non-Jews over in that area are going to recognize that Israel truly is blessed of the Lord and they're going to acknowledge the Lord. But let's look at Genesis 27, 1. Let's go to this next clip. This is a picture of Isaac. His eyes are dim when it comes to Jacob and Esau. It says, it came to pass when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim. So he could not see. So he calls Esau's eldest son and said to him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. Well, here's the thing. In the Bible, oftentimes physical blindness is a common metaphor for spiritual blindness. And Isaac was definitely spiritually blind, as well as physically blind. You know, oftentimes Christians will say, Those blind Jews, how come they don't get it? How many of you have heard that before? I hear it all the time. People say, well, those blind Jews, why don't, they, why don't they get it? Especially when they hear those things that you're saying. Well, look at Romans 11:25. It says, Paul is speaking here, and he says, I would not, brethren, that you'd be ignorant of this mystery, that you'd be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Notice it does not say blindness in totality has happened to Israel. Blindness has only happened in part. The Bible also says concerning Christians that we only see in part. We see through a glass darkly. So we see in part, and the Jews see in part. Think about this for a minute. A Jew would have to be totally blind to accept a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Messiah who abolishes Torah and whose name is followers regularly butchered to Jewish people. 
What is uh, more, such a statement ignores Christianity's own blindness to Messiah. Even though we have possessed the Gospels for 2,000 years, we are still largely blind to the real Yeshua and his Jewishness. Believe it or not, I've heard people say that Mary and Joseph were the first Christians. I don't think so. You know, even today's news, uh, Mahmoud Abbas has even said this, and this, this is recently, that Yeshua is not, wasn't even Jewish, he was a Palestinian. Okay, well, by doing that, this is what gives the okay to persecute Jewish people. But the thing we all have to realize is from Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12, where it says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. The Lord is the one who gives us a hearing ear. The Lord is the one who gives us a seeing eye. You know, in the time of Yeshua, Israel was looking for a Messiah who would be a military hero. Well, Isaac, in a sense, was choosing Esau for the same reason. He was a hunter. He was a military man. Just as Jacob came in disguise, he didn't want his identity known, so Messiah also came in disguise and didn't want his identity known. Jacob's true identity was concealed just as Messiah's was concealed. Messiah came disguised in garments of human flesh to be a sin offering on Passover. Well, do you know that God blinded Isaac's eyes to accomplish his purposes in bringing forth the Messiah through Jacob? Think about this for a minute, seriously. Had Isaac not been blinded and he could plainly recognize Esau, the redemption process would have taken a completely different turn. So if Israel had not been blinded and could clearly have identified Esau as his choice, what would have happened to the redemption of the Gentiles? It's interesting in Genesis 25, 9, where it says, Go now to the flock. This is Rebecca speaking to Jacob. And she says, bring me two kids of the goats, and I will make them a savory meat for your father. And in Genesis 27, 15, it talks about how Rebekah took a goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, uh, which were with her in the house, and she put them on Jacob, her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. So here Jacob is wearing the skins of the goats, which we realize also is what becomes part of the sin offering. Well, according to Jewish writings, Rebekah and Jacob carried out their plan to deceive Isaac, whose eyes were dimmed, on Passover. One was the Passover goat, the other was the Chagigah offering. So it's interesting that the two goats were also required on Yom Kippur. So here the Messiah takes on the role of a sin offering in disguise to win the blessing on Passover. In Genesis 27, 27 through 29, it talks about how Isaac came near and he kissed Jacob and he smelled the smell of his raiment and he blessed him. And he says this, see the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you. Nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brethren. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone that curses you and blessed be he that blesses you. Now, that's quite an incredible blessing, okay? And I don't know if you knew this, but when he blesses Esau, he switches things around. Instead of saying the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth, he says the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven. But the interesting thing about this blessing, when you look at it, is realizing what Hebrews chapter eleven twenty says. It says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, concerning the end times concerning the days of the Messiah. So we have to look at this blessing again when we just take a cursory look. We miss the depth of what God was saying because right there in Hebrews, it's saying there's something very prophetic about that blessing. So let's take a look at it through prophetic eyes. In Genesis 27, 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, may God give you, and the very first thing is of the dew of heaven. So, when the Bible talks about the dew of heaven, let's go ahead and put this next clip up. What the dew of heaven talks about is the resurrection of the dead. That's what he was talking about. We see in Isaiah 26, 19, your dead shall live 
together with my dead body shall they arise. Awaken, seeing you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth will cast out the dead. We see in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2a, where the bride says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Well, the interesting thing, I mentioned this before, the word sleep here is not, now I lay me down to sleep. In Hebrew, this is the Hebrew word that means those that sleep in the dust of the earth. So this person, she is at the, like the point of death here. It's that kind of sleep. But she says, but my heart is still beating a little bit. In Daniel 12, 2, where it says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, it's the same Hebrew word there that we see in Song of Solomon 5, 2a. And what do we see in the second part of that verse? It's, she, she hears, her, she's, she's at the point of death, but her heart's kind of beating. The Messiah comes, the bridegroom, to the door of the house, and she, she hears his voice, or she hears the knock, and she says, well, it is the sound of my beloved that's knocking, and listen to what he's saying. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. And so this, he's trying to resurrect her from the dead. It's an interesting story. I don't have time to get into the Song of Solomon, but believe it or not, I'm, uh, how many of you have heard my teaching on the Song of Solomon? It's completely different, isn't it, than anything you've ever heard before. Uh, believe it or not, I'm actually writing a book on this. I'm doing a, a writing a book finally on Solomon as a type of antichrist, which is a real shocker for most people. And I'm combining it with the Song of Solomon teaching, and I hope to have the book out in around February. So it'll be exciting. But here we have Isaac blessing Jacob and his descendants with a portion in the resurrection to come. Messiah's head is already damp with the dew of heaven by his own resurrection of the dead. And then the next thing we find, let's look at this next one, is the fatness of the earth. So let's look at the olive tree. The, the Hebrew word there for fatness refers to the rich oil that comes from an olive tree. Uh, the Hebrew word is shemen, and it means uh, oil from the olive tree, the anointing, okay? Psalms 23, 5, it says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. So olive oil is what is used for the anointing, just like in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. In Daniel 9, 25, it talks about, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to Mashiach, the prince will be seven weeks. Well, the word Mashiach also means to be anointed. So this blessing is prophesying to Jacob that from his seed will come the promised Messiah, the anointed one. Then we also see it says, and may you have plenty of grain and wine. So let's go to the next one. Here's the grain. In Jeremiah 31, verse 11 and 12, it talks about how the Lord has redeemed Jacob. You can see a direct tie-in to the story of Jacob and his blessing. It says, he ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and will flow together in the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil. We have three things here, the wheat, the wine, and the oil. It says, and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul will be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Well, there's no end to the blood of the Messiah or his body as represented by the bread that fed the 5,000. And we know the wheat, the wine, and the oil speaks messianically of all the festivals. Then it says, let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Okay, so what is that saying? So let's look at the next clip. In Psalm 72, 6 through 11. It says, The Messiah will come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, the abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. And then it says, He's going to have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. His enemies are going to lick dirt. It says, the kings of Tarshish and the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. It says, all kings will fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So it's telling Jacob that through Messiah coming through his seed, everyone's going to bow down to him. And then it, 
is finishes with this phrase, and curses everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Many of you are familiar. Do you remember what the word bless means? What is, what's another? To kneel, exactly. The very word bless means to kneel before. When you think, I can't help but think of the, the husband and wife or not quite, they're about to get married. And you see the picture of the man kneeling down on one knee, you know, having the ring, will you marry me? Okay, and what a blessing that is to the bride. Yes, she says, hopefully. And, but the whole idea of, of to bless someone is not to have them sit down while you power over them, I'm the one who's blessing you. No, to bless means you come before the other one on bended knee. Now, a lot of people, and Christians particularly, quote Genesis, where God says, I will bless those that bless you, right? But you know what that really is saying? That really is saying, can you come and kneel before Israel? Can the church kneel before Israel when they bless them, not stand over them and act like haughty, I'm the one who gives the blessing? No, to truly to bless Israel, it means you come to Israel on bended knee. Interesting thought. Psalms 118, 26, it says, Blessed is he coming in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. You know, talking about cursing those who curse you. Look at Psalms 2, 1 and 3. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. Israel is God's anointed. But do realize when you come against Israel, you're also coming against God. And listen to what they say. Let's break their bands in two and cast away their cords from us. It goes on to say in verse 11 and 12, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled in but a little time. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. That's an interesting verse. We'll talk about that more at the end where it says serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. In other words, this, 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 you're rejoicing, you love him, but you're also trembling. I think all too often in much of the body of the Messiah, there's a lack of respect for God. He's become our pal. You know what I'm talking about? We need to get beyond that. Okay. We're doing okay. I'll zip through this next part here. The Haftorah portion is from Malachi. And let's look at the tie-in. In our Torah portion, Jacob is on the run from Esau, right? And only returned around 20 years later. Well, in our Torah portion, or in our Haftorah portion, I should say, Israel has again been on the run. They've left the Promised Land after being destroyed by the Babylonians. And now they're returning also. Again, after generation. And interestingly enough, Esau had his hands in this as well. So we see a thousand years earlier, or about 1,500 years earlier, the time of Jacob, he's on the run from Esau. He comes back. 1,500 years later, we read in the Haftorah portion, Jacob was on the run from Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian captivity. The temple's about to be rebuilt. They're coming back. And we see Esau had his hand in that as well. In Obadiah 1, 10 through 12, it says, because of your violence against your brother Jacob, shame will cover you. You'll be cut off forever. And the day that you stood on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive of his forces, foreigners entered into his gates, yet they cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have looked on the day of your brother and the day that he became a stranger. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. It goes on to say that they even blocked their escape so they would be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Now Malachi, so you know a time frame, Malachi is prophesying around 433 BC. Why is that important? Because it's about the same time as Nehemiah and the rebuilt temple, Ezra. So the temple's being rebuilt, and it's already in progress. The services have started again. But what's interesting is look at Malachi 1.1. Now, do you remember the Assyrian captivity around 700 B.C. when all the northern tribes were scattered? 
200 years later, 570, 586 BC, Judah is scattered. This is another 100 years later, so it's been 300 years since the, the northern tribes were scattered. And yet look at what, how it begins in Malachi 1.1. This is the burden of the word of the Lord to who? Not to Judah, to Israel. So here he's writing to Israel. So isn't this odd? He's writing to Israel who supposedly got lost 300 years earlier. I guess they weren't lost or he couldn't write to them. But here's our connection to the Torah portion. Look at Malachi 1-2. He says, I've loved you, saith the Lord. And yet you say, well, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob? Well, we're going to take a look at this more in a few minutes. But do realize God is reminding Israel, especially after the Babylonian captivity, the destruction of the temple, they come back. You can see why they're thinking God doesn't love me. Look at what's happened to us. Okay, but God is reminding Israel that he is in covenant with them, that he did choose them. And God also witnessed what horrible things Esau had done earlier. So in this portion that we're looking at, in the Haftor portion, the temple's already rebuilt. This is a new generation. They're offering sacrifices. You would think they would be grateful. Yet there are three problems. All of them are related to the work of the priests. Number one... It says the altar is compared to a dinner table, you're going to find, with God as the guest. And what do we find in verse 7 and 8? God is complaining that they're offering polluted bread upon his altar. And you say, wow, have we defiled you? And that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? So here they are offering polluted bread, polluted, defiled animals, in number two, the second problem actually runs deeper. It was the attitude of the priests. You would think there's nothing wrong with offering polluted food. Think about it. It's one thing that they're offering it. It's another thing that they don't even realize it's wrong. And they're supposed to be the priests. And then thirdly, through their actions, they were communicating to all the people that it didn't really matter what they brought to the Lord. The important thing was just go through the motions. How often do we see that today? I mean, you look at the church sometimes, it's an entertainment facility. We're just here to entertain. You can uh, come and pollute the sanctuary with all kinds of things. And no one even thinks it's wrong. They're allowing it. And so the, the priesthood, so to speak, are communicating to everyone, it doesn't matter just as long as you give me your tithe. Look at Malachi 1.11. Here's what it's all about. It says, for from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God says, my name is to be great among who? Think about it. God was upset. His name wasn't even great among his own people. But he's saying, my name is even going to be great among all the world, all the nations. He says, and in every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name, my name shall be great among the heathen. God wants to be considered great among everyone. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you don't hear it, if you won't lay it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord, I'm going to send a curse on you, and I'm going to curse your blessing. We'll stop there. That's probably a good place to stop. So, let's stand. And we'll take a better look at this, the second half. And let's pray. Avinu, Malkenu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. I pray, Lord, you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to understand what you're trying to communicate to us. We love you so much. Time is uh, quickly coming to when your son returns. We're looking forward to that day. And I pray that we would all be found faithful. Father, we just lift up any uh, tithes or offerings that are coming in. We pray, Lord, that they would bless you, because truly that's what we're here for, to magnify your name, to make your name great among the heathens. And uh, thank you for allowing us to take your Torah to the nations. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal 
Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. One other thing, Lita Ray, it's her 70th birthday today. <laughs> Woohoo! Take a break. We'd take our seats. If you could just call everyone in from the lobby so we can get started. Okay, there's a couple of things, you know, this Torah portion of Pastor Mark, we just talked about it very briefly. First of all, we're talking about Edom or Esau. Edom, of course, refers to Esau, and there are several pronouncements against Edom and Esau in the book of Isaiah as well as Jeremiah. Um, God was not very happy with, with Edom because of how, they, how the nation or how Edom treated Israel and Judah. Uh, and it's interesting because, and this was kind of a midrash we talked about, not that you have to believe this or, or whatever, but some of the skins that they say that Jacob had put on uh, so that Isaac would think he was Esau was actually a robe that came from Adam that was passed, uh, or actually they say Nimrod stole it, and then it was taken from uh, Nimrod by Abraham who passed it on to Isaac, and because Isaac loved Esau, uh, passed it along to Esau, but that was what was so significant. But that's a midrash, okay? So it doesn't mean you need to believe that necessarily because the Jewish people love to tell stories. Uh, but what's interesting, too, is about Rivka, who is Rebecca, uh, and the parallels between herself and Eve. Because we know that, e that Adam was deceived in the transgression. And, of course, Eve was the initial part of that, the issue that happened in the Garden of Eden. But Rivka or Rebecca, possibly knowing about that and, and knowing about the, the maternal great, great, great grandparents, wasn't, didn't want to see, because she knew her own son Esau, didn't want to see the conflict between the nations. And that's why she put Jacob up to the little scheme against Isaac. So it's interesting when we, we think about, we, sometimes we read the word, we don't look at our own family conflicts into the word, but we can see those things actually happening and how it changed the destiny of mankind because the, the promised seed was able to continue on. It's a little bit kind of what I shared last week about David. Uh, if that conflict had been allowed to happen, uh, the seed or the, the throne would have not have gone to Solomon. So it's interesting how God works, isn't he? Let's all stand this morning. And interestingly, how God works, this is the time to lift our hearts to God. This is the time to, to get quiet within ourselves. And, and I would say more so to stay focused because this is the season of the year when people go berserk. But when we focus on the Lord, we know that he comes through for us. He hears our prayer, and he will bring to pass those things that we desire according to his will. So, Heavenly Father... Praise your name today. And Father, as we raise up a prayer to you today, as we enter into worship, that, Lord, we're confident that you hear us. Father, we trust in you, for you are God alone. There are no others. Thank you, Father. In thanksgiving for all that you've already done for us and will continue to do and see us through in these, these days. In Yeshua's name. Father, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Help us to think on those things, the good things, Father, things which are pure, things which are, are holy, things which are just, for you are a just God. Justice and judgment of the habitation of your throne, Father. Help us, Father, to walk in your discernment and in your light, because in your light we shall see light. Oh, Lord. We lift our country to you today. Well, Father, we lift our administration to you and those that are seeking offices in, in various positions in our government. That, Lord, we don't know who's, 
who to vote for necessarily, but Father, you know what direction to, to lead us into. You know who to put in office to fulfill your will. Help us, Father, to make wise decisions right down to, the, to a city council seat, Father, to a mayor, to a governor, that, Lord, that our country can come back to you, that there be godly men who seeks you, Father, with a pure heart. And just like with Joseph, where is there a man who, who has the Spirit of God in him that can help to lead our nation? Father, may it be so that we trust in you, Father, for that to happen. And that every citizen that's in this great country, Father, that they turn their hearts to you. Father, why does there have to be a disaster? Why does it have to be something that will just spiral into to oblivion, but more so, Father, that people just turn to you because you're a good God and you're a faithful God that has carried us to this day and to this time. Bless these people here today uh, that are in El Shaddai, Father, that, uh, that have such a heart to come week after week and Mondays and other days that are just such a, a blessed people because they know you. Bless them, Father, that together, uh, and Father, that in this moment that we share together with you, that uh, we won't recognize it, Father, three months or five months from now, because, Father, it'll blossom uh, into, a, into something that we've never imagined before, that Torah will just take off through the nations. And not only, Father, Gentiles, but the Jews together, Father. We will be standing shoulder to, to shoulder, sharing Torah, Father, and worshiping and, and, and blessing you, Father. Oh, Lord, bless these people in their health and in their finances, that they're prosperous in all of their ways. Those, Father, that, that are ill or uh, uh, for some reason that they're infirm, Lord, that, uh, that you heal them. Uh, and, Father, for those here that uh, may be in a situation of indecisiveness, uh, they don't want to go this way. They, they want to go the other way, but it just seems that this way is right. But, Father, you guide and direct them. Our way is a way unto death, but your way is perfect. Father, you said that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Father, guide us to your light, to your word, to your truth, to your heart. Help us to walk in your holiness. Help us, Lord, to always focus on, on your people Israel. and the land of Israel, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. Those people don't have to no longer be worried about rockets falling on their cities or their children running into shelters or their, their elderly father who, who, who may not have enough food to eat. Uh, that they're surrounded by enemies. They never know what's going to happen, Father, that uh, their eyes will open. They will look for Mashiach. They'll look for Yeshua. They'll return to the Shabbat, and you will honor that, Father, when you hear their cry as you've heard it before. Oh, Lord, help us to be a part of these last days. For others, Father, it's terrifying. They make movies about it to scare people. But, Father, we're not afraid because we know that we are still. We know that you are God and you are with us. We praise you. We love you. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Man, what a great God we have. What a great time to be alive. Please be seated. Pastor Mark's going to come up in a moment. Uh, boy, praise God. I'll tell you, I don't know what it's like for you folks out there, but it sure is with the dancers and the worship, it's just electrifying. Thank you, musicians. Uh, spiritually electrifying. If you talk to some of the others that stand up in here and pray, sometimes they don't know if they're going to fall down or not. It just gets so powerful. Praise God. Pastor Mark's going to come up here in a second to acknowledge some of our guests, but I want to uh, mention to you that are uh, guests here for the first time, we'd like to welcome you uh, into our guest pavilion to meet with Pastor Mark and ask any questions that you would like. We'll be up there as well. And those of you that need to be prayed for or need to pray for someone or you just want to come up to the altar when Pastor Mark closes out the service, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. So Pastor Mark... All right, thank you. If you are here visiting for the very first time, we have a gift for you. If you just raise your hand and keep your arm raised so the ushers can find you. Let's give them a big hand, all those that are visiting. All right, we'll leave your hand raised here. And if you would, we always like to find out where everyone is from. So where are you from? What city, state, country? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Definitely a waste. And how about you? Scottsdale, Arizona. Scottsdale, Arizona. All right. Portland, Oregon. All right. Three different states already. Yes, way there in the corner. 
Anchorage, Alaska. All right. How about you? Where are you from? Des Moines, Washington. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, yes. Okay, so who came the farthest, Anchorage or Los Angeles or Scottsdale? Anchorage. Anchorage. Well, where's the Anchorage person? I have a Jerusalem military hat to get you from Israel. <laughs> Looks like you wear hats, so that works out good. All right, thank you. All right. Now, this is a code word. Gidonites. <laughs> come on up. Those that went to Israel with me, come on up. We want to give you a chance to share a few things about the trip, what it meant to you for a little bit. Almost all of us are still waking up at 2 in the morning, so we're doing all right. All right, John, we'll start with you. Now, as you realize, there's a lot of us, so even if you share two minutes, there goes half the day, so keep that in mind. Oh, what we also did, we printed photographs of the people that were with us on the trip from Canada and South Africa and California so our video cameras can focus on the pictures. And when they see us, they'll know that we are still remembering them. They're all holding different people. But we had people from all over. We had people from Germany, uh, and uh, Canada and South Africa. We have people from Alaska, California, Texas, South Carolina, Virginia, just all over. But we'll start with John. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to start with, a, it's not a redneck joke, but you've heard the story, you know you're redneck if, okay, you know you have serious jet lag if you go to bed at 4 p.m., wake up at midnight, 1 a.m., you're fixing a full breakfast. <laughs> Guilty charged. I'm still suffering from that. Still waking up at midnight, can't go back to sleep. <clears throat> but how do you explain two weeks in about five minutes, ten minutes? It's almost impossible. Two. The awesome <laughs> of the whole place. Huh? Nothing, go ahead. <laughs> I'm hard of hearing. I didn't hear what he says. I can keep on talking. But I think I said this before, our trip to the Sea of Galilee, I think, is the highlight of my whole trip. We was on the lake, out in the middle of the lake, the captain shut the boat off, and we were floating, and we had one hour of worship service, yes. singing and praising. And the last song I remember is, um, he's coming in the clouds. I can't remember how the song goes. The days of Elijah. The days of Elijah. He's coming in the clouds. And that was the last song, and I was looking east, and I was just seeing if he was coming. <laughs> it was so prevalent, so vital, that it, it was, what can I say? You have to be there. By the, the very first song we sang was Let It Rain, and it was just gorgeous. By the end of the week, it was raining in Jerusalem, so... Yeah. Um, I have to agree with John. Um, the first thing was the Sea of Galilee, and that was kind of how we started out our trip, which was just nice, peaceful, um, relaxing boat ride, um, worshiping um, on the Sea of Galilee. Um, but my biggest thing was visiting the um, IDF. I have always been a huge supporter of our military and also Israel's military. So that was probably just, oh, I felt like I could just go now and I would be totally fulfilled. Um, but I want to just say something real quick that I wasn't going to say is this picture that I'm holding. Um, I got baptized in the Jordan River, and I, that's the first time I was ever baptized. And also this picture that I'm holding, it was the first time they were baptized too. And I got this picture just randomly. So um, I just want to say thank you, God, and thank you guys. I didn't know what to expect going to Israel, I was trying not to have any expectations, but nevertheless, I was still thinking there was going to be something big, something wow. What it was is God just meeting me everywhere in the faces of the people, the determination of those in Hebron and Itamar on the front line, uh, these precious hats that we received from one of the divisions in the northernmost part of Israel 
fighting on the front line all the time. I was so much in awe of those young people that I, I was hesitant to go talk to them. I thought, what could I possibly say? But God just laid it on me to just say what was in my heart. And so it's just basically, we are honored to be here. All I can say is, it's true. I'm changed now, and God willing, I, I will be new from evermore. Amen. I don't like to talk, so I'm not going to say much, but it was amazing, awesome. All I want to do is go back. That's all I want to do. I want to go back. What I could say is it uh, exceeded all expectations. I, I went with uh, ideas in my mind of what was going to happen, and it was just uh, way beyond what you had ever con conceived would uh, happen. And it was a fast pace. It was a wonderful time. I loved planting the uh, trees in uh, Shiloh and Itamar. Wherever we went, we had a, uh, the people were just very open to us and willing to talk to us. And... We're interested in what we were doing. Um, it was all great. Thank you. Okay, this is my new family. They adopted me. I'm his auntie. And she's my sister, and that's my brother, and these other two are my nieces and nephews. Okay, and this is Angie. She's from Germany. And they are from California. And Angie is from Germany. And Pastor Mark asked me before I went, what was I expecting? And the only thing I can think of is, I want to get baptized. I wasn't thinking about seeing nothing. I was just thinking about going down in that water. So <laughs> the day we got baptized, we had to tell why we were getting baptized. And I just made it real. I said, I have sinned since I've been walking with Christ, I lied, whatever. I was there to get complete. And I went, hey, when I went in that water, <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I said I was going to be composed today. When I, <laughs> when I stepped in the water, it was cold. And then when it got about right here, it was all right. And when Pastor Mark took me down and brought me up, it was like I was coming up in the newness of life. And that, hey, glory. <laughs> Woo! That was my most exciting part when I went. And then when we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, there were olive trees there over 2,000 years old. And they had a fence around it. I said, I agree with that fence because people will start pulling leaves and breaking branches and the trees will be dead. And uh, we went over to the private side. And when I went in that garden, it was just Jesus. You know, Yeshua was there. And I was like, Lord, the scriptures say you fell on your face. Did you fall over there? Did you fall over there? You know, and it was just the presence of God all in the garden, and that was my two favorite things. Every day was a, a new adventure, and now when we read, my husband and I read the Bible, uh, we look at it and it just pops out, and it just goes, we were there, oh, look, at we, we understand it. And I tell you, they're saying over there is next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Next year in Jerusalem, you <laughs> must go. Godone, our uh, guide, was incredible. He knew somebody of somebody of somebody, and we were in places that we would have never gotten to go see. It truly was amazing. We were blessed. And the, the pictures here, I've got to tell you how important it is that we are getting the word by video, by the Internet. This is their church. They, some of the, they don't have a church. We are their church. And that's what they kept on telling us. They got to meet their pastor for the first time. They got to see and meet the family of believers here. We love you out there. We are our brothers and sisters. And so, yeah. Um, all of us who went to Israel learned that there's one reason that you go to Israel, and that's because God invites you. 
That was extremely profound, I think, for all of us who learned that. So if you find in your heart that God is inviting you, you must go. You must go. It's an incredible experience. There's no way to put it into words. Um, and I think as time goes on, it will continue to change and change us more and more deeply. There's no place else on this earth that you can stand on rocks and see where Abraham stood. There's no way to comprehend that even when you're standing there. And in that same town of Hebron, those people are living surrounded by 97% Palestinians. And you just can't imagine how they live that way with the courage and the fortitude. And when you ask them, they say, you live. And if you give up an inch, they win. So it's incredibly profound, and we got to experience prophecy coming alive, as well as history. We think about the Bible as a history book, and it is, but we forget that history is today and tomorrow and the future. And we got to plant olive trees and help green the hills of the barren places in Israel. It's a phenomenal experience, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Hashem changes all of us and what He does for the people of Israel and for the people around the world. And thank you all of our internet family. We love and miss you all. And I just want to say what a tremendous blessing it is to spend two weeks with believers of like mind. So many of us are overwhelmed that we feel alone sometimes in our areas where we don't have, especially the people in South Africa and other areas, they don't have anybody else. And to come together with like-minded people I mean, you think a Shabbat service is amazing? Try spending two weeks solid. It's incredible. So thank you, Pastor Mark and Vicki and Gadon and amen. Israel. Oh, wait, it's Israel. Well, I didn't know really what to expect, but it was just so special. Uh, my favorite part, I believe, was uh, the worship service on the Sea of Galilee. I just felt like if if I went there and had to go home the next day, it would have know. been worth it. It was just, just wonderful. And then I was uh, just impressed by the fact that well, I, when we had the, the armored bus that went to, to Hebron, uh, I wasn't afraid at all. I was not afraid the whole time we were there. I, I just, God was, was with us. and. Uh, just such a blessing, and just the, the people, how we were just all like one body, uh, just the love, it was just just amazing, because I didn't know anyone, I, I had met a couple people before, I think a week or so before we left, but I just love everyone who was there, and I think uh, Angela from... Uh, Germany is going to come and visit me, and uh, Sharon from Texas. So uh, I've just, I just loved it. And if you have a chance to go, just, just go. <laughs> you won't be sorry. I'm Lenny Sutton, and I had it was an incredible blessing for me. I, I took my parents with me, so it was kind of a special family time for us. It was all of our first time there. Um, I think it was overwhelming for all of us to be able to be buffeted by the wind there, eating the food there, um, meeting the people there, um, getting a chance to meet some of our internet listeners, and uh, just knowing that we're all one family, and the only reason that, the only reason that brings us together is Yeshua. And uh, I agree with everything that everyone else said too, and I. One of the things I learned from Gadon is that when a Jewish person comes into the land, they plant a tree because they're there to stay and to, to, to live. And it, it was just so evident that they're all about life. And it just brought to life all the words, um, all the political problems helped me understand a little bit better. It's, it's a very complicated problem. Um, and we know that it, it's going to take Messiah to solve it so that we can trust in him. Thank you. You can be seated. <clears throat> Lenny, you can put the microphone here. And if you would go ahead and put up the first clip of the video, of the uh, tour. Uh, many of you have noticed they have these hats on. We got to visit a military, ba an artillery base while we were there. And uh, 
they gave all of us this hat, and on the hats, uh, what it says uh, basically is, in English, the Storm Battalion, and then underneath it says, to be number one, you have to put forth the effort, which is really good. And I'm going to take just a moment and show you some of the pictures from our trip, and then I'll jump back to uh, the sermon where we're at. So let's go ahead and put up the first one. Here's the Sea of Galilee going on a little boat ride. That was the first morning when we got there after jet lag and everything. It's good to have a peaceful moment. How many of you have been to Israel before? <clears throat> You've been to Gennesar, and they have this boat called the Jesus boat or the Yeshua boat. An archaeologist discovered it, and it's a 2,000-year-old boat. This is a boat that existed during the time of Yeshua. Now, our tours are different than every other tour because we go to places that are unseen sites. Obviously, some of you have seen this, but we do things that are different because we are different. <clears throat> what I mean by that is this. After going to the museum of the boat, guess who shows up? The archaeologist who discovered the boat. And he was there with us to talk to our group. So that was made it really exciting, those of you that have been there. Uh, after that, this is a little sunset on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this was the military base. The soldiers literally, had, we had lunch there. They made food for us. They knew we were coming, and they made this great big buffet of this fantastic food that we got to eat with them. But before that, these are like tanks of the enemy that were out in this field. You'll see like a barrel right here on this tank. They had a barrel, I think, right here on this tank. But so anyway, these are the enemy tanks. Well, we got to literally watch them do tank drills, shooting their tanks. And so I was there. Here comes one of the Israeli tanks moving really fast over this hill. And it spots the enemy tanks. And so the next thing, boom. And then we saw uh, the after effects there. And that, see where it hits the enemy's tank. And they were all thrilled and everything. And uh, then these tanks, this is a Merkava 3, they're equipped with this fog where they can hide themselves from the enemy. And so they release this fog so the enemy on the other side can't see their escape as they're trying to come back. And so here's just some pictures of uh, the fog. That's all that is. It's just fog that they emit, which is really fun to be able to watch them. Now, I don't know how many tours get to do this. Uh, and then after that, you know, they're waving hi to us, but I'm liking, well, turn the turret, please, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Great you're saying hi. But what's really neat is the commander, the general, whatever this base is religious, you can see his keeper. And so here, uh, this is Dirk Dupuy from South Africa. Here, this is Lee Armstrong from our group, but here's some soldiers. The whole battalion there stops, and we're reading Psalms 83. So we haven't read that. So here you have all these soldiers praying to God that God would protect them in this. So it was really a special time on the military base. And then here's the other thing. Uh, Unseen Sites, or Yisrael Stefanski, he's the one that uh, I asked him several years ago. I said, you need to put together, I didn't want to do a normal tour. He was never a tour operator. But I said, you need to help me do tours. So he just started this on his own, as well as running Unseen Sites, uh, as well as several other things that he does. But so anyway, one of the things that he also has is Israel Support Fund. And what Israel Support Fund does is to help terror victims. We like to avoid all the administrative costs. You know when you donate something, typically 80% goes to administrative and 20% to the actual situation? Well, for him, everything that goes to Israel Support Fund, 100% goes right to the terror victims or to right whatever we're doing. Well, we want to support the IDF. We want to support the military. So while we were there on the base, they had made no winter's coming. They needed fleeces. So uh, we got them all fleeces. And so here on Monday when we left, Israel went there, Yisrael, Yisrael Stefanski went there, and we donated these soldiers the fleeces. They're so thankful for El Shaddai and Israel Support Fund giving them. And here's a picture of Yisrael Stefanski and Art Matthias and all the group thanking El Shaddai for helping them get warm winter clothing. And we want to continue to do this. So I just want to say to the people on the internet, I haven't told Tom yet who runs our web, but on our homepage, I want to have this little Israel Support Fund logo 
And if you want to donate to the IDF, they do have a thing called Friends of the IDF, which is great, but a lot of it goes to administrative. If you want to support the IDF and know that things are going to get hand-delivered to the soldiers themselves, give to Israel Support Fund through our website and let them know that you want to support the troops, and it'll all 100% will go there. How many of you ever heard of Stand Good Enough? You guys, anyone ever heard of Stand Good Enough? He is incredible. He's a journalist. He's a commentator. He's a 23-year resident of Israel. He's a South African. He's a believer. And he also has agreed to be our tour guide next year. So here we're going to have next year Yisrael Stefanski with Unseen Sites, as well as Israel Support Fund, as well as Proactive Global Security being our tour operator with Stand Good Enough as our tour guide, and of course, I'll be your tour leader. But uh, we would love to have anyone who hasn't been to Israel to come on our trip this next year. You can call the office, Nancy or Tina. You don't have to do a deposit or anything like that, but we only take one bus. We limit it to about 45 people. So if you're interested, call the office, at least give them your name, phone number, and email so we can let you know that you're on the list. Here's from the Dead Sea, and back here's Jordan, all these different color of brown mountains. But we do stay in nice hotels for you. Here's the moon uh, over Jordan from the Dead Sea. Oh, back here is from a lot. Uh, we went down to a lot, and I'm looking through glass right here. I didn't go scuba diving. <laughs> <clears throat> but we got to see some ibex out in the wild. Some, I should have lightened those up a little bit, but really cool. There's the wilderness of Zin where Israel wandered for a long time. Beautiful uh, pictures of the Negev. Here's the sun setting over Jerusalem. Uh, this is Mount Ebal, and here is Mount Gerizim. This is Shechem, and you'll kind of see this real big Arab house right here. I'll give you a close-up view in a minute. But this is all, this is forbidden for Jews to go to, this whole area of Shechem and Joseph's tomb. They, they can't even go there. And this is where the, the Levites were and the 12 tribes yelling out the cursings and the blessings and all of that. This is where Joseph... Uh, tomb is at Shechem but we're looking at it from Itamar so we're on Itamar looking towards Shechem uh, this is the Fogel family house many of you heard about the Fogel family this last Passover they were killed we went to the Fogel family's home on Itamar okay this is Awarta this is how close this is a picture taken from the back of the Fogel family's home this is where the Arabs came from that murdered them is how close they are right there and then here's where we were planting the trees uh, in Itamar at the base of the hill. And it's called Itamar because Aaron's son, Itamar, is buried there. And I saw this one pretty last planting a tree. Oh, that's Vicky. But here from Mount Gerizim, over here is Itamar. So we were up here before looking at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Now we're on Mount Gerizim here looking toward Itamar. And this is Joseph's tomb right here. We couldn't go down there. Be, they'd kill us. So we're up on this big hill, Mount Gerizim, and we're looking down there. I have a camera with a zoom lens. I kind of zoomed in. But right here is Joseph's tomb. And if you remember a few years ago, notice the dome. Uh, that's the thing that the Arabs uh, desecrated and rioted and destroyed it and did all kinds of horrible things on top and inside a few years ago. And this is where Limor Livnot's nephew was murdered this last Passover. He tried to go visit there. These are the famous stairs. These are the actual steps that Abraham walked up 4,000 years ago when he paid Ephron the Hittite for the cave of Machpelah where Sarah was buried. And so we're there at that Torah portion looking at the very stairs that Abraham was on when he weighed out the silver for Ephron the Hittite. This wall is built in the time of Noah. That's how old this wall is. This was built in the time of Abraham right here. So you see some pretty old stuff there. This is one large stone. I don't know how many tons it weighs, but this is at the under, uh, under the wall tour, under the Temple Mount. It's an incredible large stone. And then, of course, we ended at the Holocaust Museum. We go to places no one ever goes. We, we get on the armored bus, and we go to Hebron. And we go to Shiloh. We go to Itamar. Uh, this next year, we're probably going to go to Stay Rote. Uh, Tel Megiddo, where Elijah slew the prophets of Baal, Ariel, different places like that. But I encourage people, how many of you know the media is biased? Well, you really see that when you go to Israel. You really do. 
And I just encourage anyone who wants to go on one of our trips uh, to give us a call so we can get you booked on there. Okay, we were looking at Malachi at the tie-in to the Torah portion where he talks about how Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. But let's take a look at Romans 9, 10 through 16. This is a tie-in to the Haftor portion as well as the Torah portion. It says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purposes of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him that calls. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. Oftentimes when we read that, we look at, man, God is hard. He's tough. Look at that. He's, he, man. Well, I'm going to give you more of a Hebraic understanding here so you can understand what is really going on in this verse. You have to look at everything in the Hebrew. So we're going to look at some of these words that they were quoting in the Torah so we have a better understanding of what God was trying to communicate here. First off, when God says, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion, do you remember when that was said in the Torah? Does anyone remember? Not where, because you can look at the next verse and see where. So the question is, what, what was the context? The context of that is when God is declaring his name to Moses. Moses wants to be put in the cleft of a rock. God's glory is going to pass by. God's proclaiming his name. That is the setting. We see in Exodus 33, 17 through 19. The Lord says unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. And he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Okay, let's put up this. Let's go to this next clip. There's like three levels of mercy. You can read the word mercy three different times, but there are three different word, Hebrew words with three different meanings that are all translated as the English meaning of mercy. So if you don't know which Hebrew word it's referring to, you missed the whole picture. So I'm going to explain to you the three Hebrew words that are translated mercy, but also translated other ways as well. The first one is in your Strong's number 2617. It's chesed, and it means kindness. In other words, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. God is kind to all of his creation. In Psalm 136, 25, it talks about God. He gives food to all flesh for his mercy endures forever. In other words, his loving kindness endures forever. The wicked receives his loving kindness as well as the righteous receives his loving kindness. That's his chesed. And then the next one is Hanan. And Hanan means to be gracious or merciful. But here's the difference. It means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor. In other words, it means to get personally involved. Okay? We see in Psalms 4, 1, David cries out, Hear me when I call. In other words, God, I know you're merciful to the wicked and to the, the righteous, but I want you to hear, listen to me. Please hear my prayer. So he says, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Hear the word mercy is kanan. In other words, would you please get personally involved in my life? It's great that you're merciful toward everybody, but how about showing some of that to me, God? So that's kanan. And then lastly, you have racham. Here, racham symbolizes compassion. By extension, look at this, the womb as cherishing the fetus. We see this in Isaiah 46, verse 3 and 4. It says, Hearken to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. Here's that word. 
And even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and I will deliver you. So what's the differences here? I like to tell a story of like an orphanage. Let's say you want to go, there's the good kids in the orphanage and the bad kids in the orphanage, and you give all of them a cookie, both the good and the bad. That is chesed, loving kindness. You're giving all the good and the bad kids a cookie. But let's say there's one kid who's too short and he can't reach the cookie jar. So he's saying, help me, help me, okay? So Canaan is when you get personally involved in that kid's life and you're merciful to him and you pick him up to allow him to get his hand in the cookie jar. Even if he's one of the wicked kids, you still get personally involved and help him. So God is saying, look, I am righteous. I let the rain and the sun fall on the just and the unjust. Not only that, I will get personally involved in the wicked person's life and help them. I will stoop down and help them just like the righteous. But then this last one, Rakam is the womb. So going back to the orphanage story, when God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, he's talking about the word Rakam. He's saying, look, I, gener- I, I give loving kindness to the wicked and the righteous. I will get personally involved in the wicked and the righteous. But who I take home is who I going to take home. And the orphanage story says, I'm going to adopt this one. So God says, I'm merciful to everyone. I get personally involved with everyone, but I decide who I'm going to take home. And so in Jonah 4.2, you see this phrase, uh, two different Hebrew words here. In Jonah, it says, he prayed to the Lord, and he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before into Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious. Okay, that's Canaan. I knew that you get personally involved and you are merciful, that is refer, Raham, referring to the womb. You're slow to anger and of great kindness, that's chesed. So here you see all three different Hebrew words used in this one verse. So let's go now to this next one. And so let's look at Exodus 33, 19. Let's look at this verse now in context. Here he says, I will make all my goodness and pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will stoop in kindness. That's 2603, which literally means to stoop down to get involved. To an inferior, to whom I will be gracious. Okay, again, Canaan. And I will show mercy, Racham, on whom I will show mercy, Racham. So God is merciful to all his creation, the good and the bad letting the rain fall on the unjust as well as the just. God does intervene and is merciful to all of his creation, both the good and the bad. Personally getting involved in helping both the wicked and the righteous when they cry out for help. But God is also merciful to whomever he chooses, and he alone decides who he will adopt and take home as his very own. So, in conclusion here, what we need to realize when we look at the covenant with Jacob and Esau, and he chose Jacob to enter the covenant... We see God makes covenant with whomever he chooses. He determines the requirements of the covenant. We also see God keeps covenant. And those who abide by the covenant stay in covenant. If they get out of covenant, he is merciful to bring them back into covenant. So let's look at this last clip. I have a stepladder here. I believe there are basically four types of motivation to fulfill God's will. How many of you want to fulfill God's will? I mean, one of my favorite prayers is what Art was even praying in part of his prayer. God, work in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Okay? Why do we serve God? How many of you realize when we first come to God, we come to God pretty selfishly? But really, seriously. When we come to God, it's out of fear of punishment. We're afraid God's going to punish us, and so we come running to God. That's how our immature relationship, so to speak, begins with God. Fire insurance. In other words, what we do, we do the will of God out of fear, either out of fear of punishment or out of fear of being spiritually defiled, uh, caused by sin. This is referred to as a lower level of fear. So here, this is when we first come to God, most of the time, and I believe most of you will realize it when you think about it, when I came to God, I know I can speak for myself, man, I was afraid. I thought I was, you know, straight to hell, don't pass, go, don't collect $200, just there. 
So anyway, I, I came to God totally out of fear. It's called a lower level of fear. Then the next step, as we build, and some people in our walk with God are still there. They never get any further than that. But the next step is out of reward. Okay, and doing God's will, and we love him in order to receive material blessings and spiritual reward. This is called the lower level of love. In other words, I love God. Well, wouldn't you love God too if he kept giving you blessings? Yeah, God, I want to, see, yeah, I, I, you know, so I came to God initially myself out of fear of punishment and hope for reward. Hey, this is a pretty good deal. But what happens when all of a sudden some of those blessings stop? All of a sudden we curse God, we get mad at God because here this God that, you know, all of a sudden withholds some blessing. So sometimes we love God, we grow from a fear of God to a love for God, but it's still a very self-centered love. It's a, how many of you would want your kids uh, to only talk to you if you gave them a dollar? You know, or they would talk to you because they're afraid if they didn't, you might spank them. Well, God doesn't want that kind of a level of relationship. But that's what happens as we mature in God. And then the next step is uh, a higher level of love. And this is doing God's will and loving God without regard for reward. This is called great love. In other words, I'm going to love God not for what I can get out of the relationship. I talked about this uh, when I first uh, got saved or whatever back in 1975, 35 some years ago. Um, like I said, I was totally fear of punishment and hope of reward. And I had heard a, t a teaching. I was in the Agape Force, this youth ministry, and it, it talked about the consequences of sin. And I used to think, what are the consequences of sin? Think about it. There's uh, physical death, sp uh, spiritual death, people who are alive but spiritually dead. You have eternal death. You have loss of peace and joy. You have wars, okay? From whence come wars? It's all the, the lust and the hate and all these consequences of sin. But what is the greatest consequence of sin? And I had to think, boy, what's the greatest? What would be the greatest consequence of sin? And I had to say, boy, it had to be eternal separation from God, hell, whatever. That had to be the greatest consequence of sin. And all of a sudden it hit me, no, that wasn't the greatest consequence of sin. Genesis 6.6, 6, it says that repented the Lord that he made man, and it grieved him at his heart. And in the Hebrew, it implies difficulty in breathing, as if God is just sobbing over creation. And so to me, I, I realized the greatest consequence of sin, all these consequences I sinned, I looked at, were totally self-centered. I never thought of how sin, my sin affected God. I only thought of how sin affected me. And so all of a sudden it hit me, wow, I need to serve God, not because of the consequence to me, but I have to stop and think of what are the consequences to God and to his kingdom. And so what we realize in a loving relationship, even though we love God, it's not necessarily out of hope of reward. We don't, like I said earlier, want to have our love for God be without the respect, the awe, and the majesty. And so the, I believe the next level in our walk with God as we mature is one of awe. And what I mean by that is doing God's will out of humility, born of an awareness of God's loftiness and his infinite greatness. On this level, one is not motivated by fear of the personal consequences of going against God's will, but rather by revulsion at the very act of going against the will of the infinite God. Think of Joseph in Pharaoh's court. Pharaoh's wife was coming to him. And his reply was, no, I might get caught and thrown in jail. No, his reply was, how can I do this against God? That has to be our motivation. The reason why I think a lot of times people keep uh, habitually going back to the same sin, they never stop to think about how it affects God. They only have self-centered thinking about how it hurts themselves. And I think if we, if we grow in our maturity, in our relationship with God, a lot of those things will stop. And this is a higher level of fear. This level transcends even the level of great love. In this fourth and highest level, we have risen to a state of true selflessness. These reflect the order in which we climb the ladder of spiritual development, first serving God out of self-interest, and eventually maturing to a relationship built on self-transcendence, where we go beyond ourselves. We don't even think about ourselves. Humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is forgetting about yourself. So we tend to limit our relationship with God to being either a love-based or a fear-based 
rather than going beyond ourselves and serve him out of an awareness of his holiness and of his glory. And I think that's where God is leading us in these last days, where we serve him for who he is. How, how can we do that against such a great and awesome God? Amen? Amen. So with that, we'll close. And if the Zockins would come up, the musicians would come up. One other thing I forgot. What I want to start doing on Monday nights, if you come Monday nights, but I'm also going to just do one on Saturdays. What that is is this. People have always, we get emails in the internet, so many people question, what? I have a question for you, Pastor Mark. I have a question for you, Pastor Mark. Rather than answering, a lot of them we find are repeat questions over and over and over. So what we're going to do on Monday nights, uh, rather than having passing the mic, having everyone ask questions in the audience, email the questions first to the office. Then I can go through the questions. It'll go a lot quicker. I can answer more questions. And then I might answer one or two questions at the end. But here's a typical question that I want to answer real quick before we close. I want you to listen to this. This comes from, I'll just say, Jorge from Mexico City. Okay? We get emails from all over the world. This one comes from Jorge in Mexico City. He writes, please answer my question. I am very sad to see my church opposing the celebration of Yeshua's feasts. I have been a Pentecostal for the past three years. I have many brothers and sisters that love me and I have found peace and joy. I've been celebrating Yeshua's feasts just since this last September. The Christians in my church are outraged as to why I've now been going to the synagogue to celebrate the feasts. They're telling me outright that I will be condemned if I go to the Jews and to the synagogue. I've been reading the book of Ephesians, and I've been revealed by the Holy Spirit about his will that the Christians should go and that the Jews should take care of themselves. Messiah will take care of the Jews instead of us trying to convert them ourselves. He says, this is the will of the Father, that a new man should emerge in Yeshua HaMashiach. I love your ministry. I believe that I am that new man in Yeshua HaMashiach. I love the Lord. I love my brothers and sisters, but I feel I'm at the point of no return. I love to be with the Jews in the synagogue, and I'm not a follower of any denomination. I'm a follower of Yeshua. Your ministry is the greatest I've ever seen so far. It has given me peace and joy in Yeshua. Please tell me what should I do. Please, I'm very sad. Please just answer this question, Jorge. I mean, how many of you know what he's talking about? So, to, you know, to Jorge, what can I say? And to other people, the people that went on our trips, they talked about this. These people from all over the world come to our congregations because they feel like they're all alone. They don't have any family. Here we have a situation where someone, you know, he's part of a congregation, but they're condemning him because he wants to connect with the Lord and with the feast. And, you know, a lot of times I don't know what to say because I don't know if there's any congregation in their area. And sometimes the congregation in the areas could be weird, you know. But uh, what I can say is definitely connect with the Jewish people. Uh, definitely come to our website and, and learn the Torah portions and try to find like-minded believers. And one thing that Art and Tom and I are going to try to do, we want to protect people's privacy, but we want to begin to connect people in other parts of the world, in other parts of the United States that come to our ministry so you can connect with like-minded people. But as far as with your, your congregation, uh, you know, he who throws mud loses ground. Okay? So I, I don't think you should get on the church that you're going to's case. You're going to find sometimes, just like me and cheesecake. I don't know if you heard my story, me and cheesecake. When I was in high school, I never ate cheesecake because it sounded weird. Finally, someone gave me a bite, and I was kicking myself for all the cheesecake I missed out on. And I think it's the same thing with the feast. A lot of the Christians, they don't, they're, they're hesitant because they, don't, they haven't tasted it and tried it. You've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So uh, my question is, there can be other people that just oppose it because they don't understand and they're in opposition rather than in questioning. So uh, ignore those that are in opposition but still love them. Uh, those that are inquiring, uh, I really recommend getting our feast DVDs. I think that's the best thing to do is get our feast DVDs and the book that accompanies it, and it's going to open the doors to a lot of the Christians' hearts. Amen? Amen. So let's stand and let's pray. Avinu, Malkinu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much. Father, so often we're like a, a desert in the wilderness crying out for the living water, and we cry out to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would quench our thirst. 
Father, quench the thirst of those from around the world, the United States and other countries that are listening. Father, meet their needs, even as they're crying out for you. Let them know they're not alone. We're all one big happy family. We're all in this together. We love one another. We support one another. We pray for one another. Let them know that. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 God loves each and every one of you so much. He just wanted to wrap his arms around each and every one of you and give you a big hug. And he wants you to know that he loves you with an everlasting love, that he will never break covenant. Matter of fact, he wants to claim you his own and he wants to place his name upon you and say, you are definitely part of my family. He told Moses to tell Aaron, here's how I want you to bless my people. I want you to say this prayer over them, and in so doing, not only will I bless them, or in other words, not only will the Lord come and kneel before you, he wants to place his name upon you. So the Lord wants to bless you in this prayer. While you're standing, the Lord wants to come and personally kneel before each one of you and give you a gift. Now that is the most humbling thing. I think in the world that the creator of this universe wants to come and kneel before us and give us a gift. Here's what he told Aaron to say. Ivarekaka Yahweh Vaishmareka Ya'er Yahweh Panavileka Vihuneka Yisa Yahweh Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, Bashem, Yeshua, HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, go and receive that blessing. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.